welcome to Retro 48K. Where to start with this one? This is probably my most requested technically correct. Uh, the Amiga has a dedicated following and still to this day quite a lively development community and it's one of the reasons I've been somewhat apprehensive to do this because not only is there a wealth of information out there already, uh, there's also a wealth of different flavours of Amiga so where do you start with it and you know it's sifting out the information that sometimes contradicts each other and finding the right bits and pieces but I'm going to give it my best shot it may not all be right but let's go with it so the Amiga A500 was first launched in 1987 and there were many flavours released after that and revisions all with little tweaks or improvements on the way to that mighty A1200 that I love um, with new terms such as OCS, ECS, AGA and all these different acronyms that came along through its life cycle However, in the end, what I've decided to do on this video is I'm mainly going to focus on the A500 and the fundamentals and concepts that it created, because most of them stayed with the Amiga through that life cycle. They were just added to and expanded upon. So hopefully this gives you a good idea of how newer Amigas worked as well as those original old ones. Now, the Amiga's in a unique system because it had a foot in two worlds. It was a home computer able to cope with a lot of the office-based applications, you know, your paint programs and things like that as well as be a great games machine uh, and it was able to keep up with often the best that consoles could do at the time, something even high-end PCs weren't capable of doing and they had much faster CPUs and much more expensive components because you see in the, in the late 80s and early 90s PCs didn't tend to have dedicated graphics processors and the sort of graphics cards you see commonplace today were a long long way off so that poor CPU in the centre of these machines did everything whereas consoles on the other hand they had dedicated video display units or video display processors or whatever that manufacturer decided to call them and they were literally designed to chuck sprites and tiles round to create 2D graphics and this meant that the PC rarely saw the smooth sort of 60 frames per second scrolling and things that the Mega Drive and SNES did because it just wasn't designed for games, it was designed for spreadsheets. Whereas the Amiga on the other hand attempted to do the best of both. They leveraged a modest CPU with all the expansion features of a, C of a PC some, and some custom hardware and graphics and sounds without that lofty price tag of a PC. And in general, it worked. The Amiga's concept was a high performance at a low price, and it did that with custom hardware. So in order to understand the Amiga, we'll have to cover the hardware first. So let's take a look at that and do a bit of a hardware breakdown. At the core of the Amiga, much like every system, it's the CPU. And the Amiga actually has the exact same CPU as the Sega Mega Drive, uh, Motorola 68000, clocked slightly less than the Mega Drive at 7.16 MHz, which it seems odd. Remember, the A500 was first released a whole year before the Mega Drive came out, and future more powerful Amigas would see faster revisions of that processor or that processor family. For example, the A3000 would use the 6 68030 chip uh, which was a faster more beefier version of it and also thanks to its home computer nature there was a series of expansions on that hardware as well that you could attach to the Amiga such as a hard disk interface fast RAM and various other expansion devices that were all connected through an expansion connector and all this was linked together through a series of buses and buffers and things like that um, along to the Amiga Kickstarter ROM now next up, you've got the RAM. So again, thanks to its home computer nature, this could range from 256 kilobytes up to two meg of what the Amiga calls chip memory, which is memory in a custom chip area. More on that in a second. And the other just general fast RAM was expandable up to eight meg uh, in the previously mentioned expansion slot. But now we come to the meat of what made the Amiga so special, and that's three custom chips, Angus, Paula, and Dennis. Now these three custom chips are what meant the Amiga could achieve really high levels of performance with relatively low cost components. These chips were custom graphics and audio chips that provided color graphics, digital audio, high performance input and output. But most importantly, they had direct access to that two megabytes of RAM. And why is that important? Well. Being able to directly access RAM and all that information within meant they didn't have to go back to the CPU constantly, meaning the CPU could spend the majority of its time on, say, your game logic and AI and things like that, and less worrying about moving sprites around. And this separation from the CPU was aided by 
copper, a core processor that resides in the custom chips. And this was a general pers uh, purpose processor that received its instructions via direct memory access, which again meant the copper could control nearly all the graphics systems without adding extra load to the CPU. It could do things like reposition sprites, change colour palettes and control the blitter, which is the other core processor. And I'll get more on that later when I start talking in details about the graphics. But for now, if you think of it this way, the CPU would sort out all the game logic, decide where stuff needed to be, update memory, and then the custom chips would read directly from that memory to draw it. There was no passing information to these chips for them to have to go back to memory and, and go to separate video memory and all this kind of stuff. It was all just CPU updates RAM, sets RAM up how it needs to be. The custom chips on the Amiga read that RAM and draw it out of the screen. Job done. It was a nice efficient process without putting loads of bottleneck on the CPU and buses and moving data all around the system constantly. But in general, that's it. That's the Amiga. Of course, you've got various interfaces for joysticks, mice, things like that. But in terms of core CPUs and just processors on the board, that's, pr that, that's pretty much got you covered from a high level perspective. So now let's move on and take a look at how this hardware actually managed to create those distinct Amiga graphics. So those graphics, well, first up, the Amiga had loads of different graphics modes that it could display in. Uh, they set the resolution of the screen and the color depth, which is basically the number of colors you could have. The first of these was the low res mode, which was 320 pixels by 256 pixels if you were PAL or 250 if you were NTSC. And it had a color depth of 12 bits, which is basically 4096 different colors you could choose from. And then there was the high res mode, which was 640 by 512 again if you were PAL. And it had as well a color depth of 12 bits. And future revisions of the Amiga would see the introduction of the enhanced chipset or the ECS, which added more and more modes like super high res. And then in 1992, we got the advanced graphics architecture or AGA, which many of you will remember from back in the day. And what this did was it basically increased color depth across the board with a few other tweaks here and there. And it went from 12 bits uh, to 24 bits color depth, which basically meant you could have 16 million, million different colour options. And now there's a lot more I could talk about here, but this video would be about 40 minutes long going through the various different modes and things, because there's a huge amount of them. So for now, it's enough to know that you had a few resolution options, and on the original hardware colour palette, you had a choice of around 496 colours to choose from. Now that didn't mean it could display all of them at once, because there were other limitations to go with, which we'll cover shortly. Now, to actually create the graphics on that uh, display area in the Amiga, it had the idea of player fields, either single or dual. Now, each player field could be scrolled vertically or horizontally, a bit like your tile layers on the Mega Drive, really, but not quite as straightforward as that. But regardless of if you did dual or single player fields, you would only have what are called bit planes. You'd only have six of them. So if you had dual, you had the front had three and the back had three, uh, or you could have six in one. But what's a bit plain? Well, it's a bit technical to go into even for this video, but if you think of it as just this, it's basically a depth for the screen, um, and the more bit planes you had, the more colours that could be used as shown on the graphic on screen. Now, that's about all you really need to know for this video. But what you could also do on these player fields was you could load tile maps onto them and scroll those, which was often done because it saves memory. If you think about it, uh, if you think about the original Mario Brothers, for example, if you stored a full map as an image and then just scrolled it left to right based on Mario running, that's quite a big image to store in memory and quite a big image to store on a cart. Whereas if you stored each little block as an individual tile and assembled them on the way, that's much less memory because you only need one tile to cover half the, well, basically the entire play field you're running on. So that's kind of how those tiles worked. Uh, and the Amiga also had the idea of icons, uh, which obviously comes from its operating system style things but they're basically you can be thinking of them as tiles as well and you could scroll individual areas of these per line so you could get line scrolling techniques again like i covered in the mega drive and snes videos that just meant that 
you could scroll different areas of the screen at different speeds to get some nice parallax effects if you didn't have multiple layers. So that's the background and your tiles and things for running on, but what about the core of any game and the, that's the sprites for your enemies and your player characters? Well, the Amiga did support hardware sprites, much like the consoles, but it had some limitations. Namely, it only had eight direct memory access channels for drawing those sprites, so you were limited to eight sprites at once. Now, if you wanted more, you could reuse one of those same channels, but you had to leave at least one scan line between one sprite and the next. So it could be difficult to use them uh, you know, if, if sprites were depending on where they were placed. And these sprites were limited as well into a maximum width of 16 pixels, 16 colors per sprite, although they could be any height. So if you were clever with the way you did them, you could use them for other things such as rain in a scene or something like that because you could have the full height of the screen. So there were some neat tricks you could do with them. But what most gamers and programmers did uh, in, instead of using those eight sprites because they were limited, they made use of something rather unique to the Amiga, and that is bobs. Now, bobs are blitter objects. Now, I talked about the blitter in the hardware section, but it was part of the Angus, and it was another core processor, and it was designed for high-speed line drawing and moving blocks around. So it basically was a, an advanced sprite drawer, really. They weren't quite fully sprites, but you can think of them as such. Uh, the basic difference is bobs weren't quite as uh, fast as hardware sprites, but they were still very quick. And they also didn't have any limitations on size, and the colour was set by the colour of the bit planes you were using. So if you had five bit planes, then you had 64 colours. As long as you had enough memory and time to read that memory, you could do what you wanted. And this is what gave the Amiga its main advantage over the consoles, which has often had very tight restrictions on the number of sprites per line and size and colour and things like that. You didn't have a lot of that on the Amiga. The other thing about sprites on the Amiga as well is a nice hardware feature that was hardware collision detection. This meant at a hardware level you could determine if sprites collided with each other and you know other sprites on the player field. And again this meant even more work was taken off the CPU and you got really accurate hitboxes. But the problem there is, I said, it's sprite collision detection. If you used bobs, it wouldn't quite work. But there was a thing called the Blitter Zero flag. Now, it's really complicated to get into because it's the result of logic operations. But basically, this flag, um, each bob had a flag on it. And if they overlapped, those flags would mismatch. So you could tell whether they overlapped. So you could do some collision detection at the hardware level on bobs they were just a bit trickier to do than the standard sprites but it was still fast and it was still really accurate which is the important part of it now all these graphics are based on direct memory access that was the key these all the, the three chips those um three custom chips that i talked about angus denise and paula could all do direct memory access so the key thing to remember in amiga in terms of concepts as far as i can tell from what i've read is while there were some hard limits to sprites and bobs and things like that, the key is balance of that memory access. If you think of it this way, your game runs at 60 frames per second, then your game code is 1 60th of a second to finish what it's doing, get the screen updated and present that back to the user, meaning you've got a finite budget of time to do your work. And you can spend that budget pretty much how you like. You could have more complex bobs and sprites and or you could have more of them, or you could have somewhere in between, but generally you couldn't do both. You couldn't have tons of really complex bobs all running around the screen. So for an example of this, if you were trying to draw a 288 by 192 plane with the blitter on a player field as a bob, and that player field was 304 by 192 pixels, that would take up about 12% of the time available in just direct memory access. Now that might be fine, you might only have another two or three things on the screen that you have to draw, so you've got loads of time to do that. You might have an absolute ton of other stuff to do, in which case that 12% is a massive part of your time. It's all about budget and managing that budget, and that was one of the key things for Amiga developers back in the day, is managing that budget. Now you notice so far in this video, I haven't really gone into sound or other parts like that, like the floppy drive, Kickstarter, ROM, etc. And the sound I've left because I'm afraid if you haven't guessed by now in these videos, I'm not really a sound guy. I love it, 
but it baffles me. All I can really tell you is it had four sound channels, two tied to the left stereo, two tied to the right. It could do both samples and FM modulation, so best of both the Mega Drive and the um, Super Nintendo, but obviously it was a different sound chip to those, so it had different tones coming out of it to give that unique Amiga sound. And the other stuff I didn't really, I haven't really covered because, well, a floppy drive is a floppy drive. I think you're more interested in how it creates the graphics if you're watching these videos than anything else. So here I've focused on that. And what makes the U Amiga so unique, and it's those custom chips and what they did for it. It was really with those chips that uh, it allowed it to create graphics much like a console, but with the expansion capabilities of a PC bridging both worlds, and in most cases providing the best of both. Yes, it was slightly more expensive than consoles, but it was a damn sight cheaper than most PCs at the time. And in many ways, the Amiga was way ahead of its time with dedicated hardware into that home computer space, something you know we wouldn't see until much later with the 3DFX cards and Voodoo cards that started to appear as 3D graphics really started to push CPUs further and further. And to the point where today, these are all commonplace and it kind of goes back to those Amiga roots, if you ask me. I think it was there that it all started and it's been incredibly interesting to research this i really have enjoyed looking into this because like i said at the start that amiga community is so strong it's creating tools using things like amos today which is a high level programming languages that means that programming for the amiga is much more straightforward than ever if you want to get into it and in the description i'll put some of the uh, bits and pieces i found if you want to start looking at some examples of someone coding on an amiga um, it's with a bit of trepidation all this though that I've published this one out because by far and away this was my most requested technically correct and the Amiga community is so good and there's so much information out there I was really worried about getting something wrong so what I'm going to ask here is have I picked anything up wrong I've trolled through a few forums and a few technical manuals and things like that but there's no substitute for experience on these machines. So if anyone is watching this and thinks I've got anything wrong, please put it in the comments. I'll issue corrections um, with pinned comments as I always do and in the description. And I look forward to hearing back from you guys because that's one of the joys of doing these things is I explain how I think it works and then people can tell me whether I'm wrong or whether or whether I pick bits up wrong and it just brings that community spirit to it. So I hope you've enjoyed this video and look out for future ones. As always, I've been Retro48K, and I'll see you next time.